Okay, welcome back. Um, so next speaker here is Seth Fargo from HashiCorp, um, talking about taming the modern data center. So please give a warm applause to Seth. Thank you. Can everyone hear me? I'm pretty loud. Um, <clears throat> so welcome. Uh, today I want to talk to you about taming the modern data center. Um, so my name is Seth. I'm the director of technical advocacy at a company called HashiCorp. How many people here have heard of HashiCorp before? Awesome. Uh, I've been at HashiCorp for almost three years now, and I've been doing this the whole time. And the first time I said that, like one person raised their hand and they worked for us. Um, so things have gotten a lot better. <laughs> for those of you that aren't familiar with HashiCorp, um, we're an open source company. Uh, we make open source tools. So it all started with Vagrant. Uh, we also make you know, Packer, Surf, Console, Terraform, Vault, and Nomad. Um, you might recognize some of these logos up here. But today I'm going to talk about three of those tools. But before we talk about technology or code or anything like that, I want to take a step back and try to answer the question of, like, why are we here? Um, not why are we in this room, but why are we in the state? Like, why are you at this conference? What problems do you have? And what technology are we trying to build to solve those problems? And to do that, it's important to talk about the evolution of the data center, or the DC. So we have this data center, and we'll define that in a little bit, but how did we get here? Well, in, say, like, you know, the 1980s or 1990s, the data center was very easy to visualize, and it was very tangible. It was a physical server in a physical room uh, that you could walk up to and touch. You could plug things in. You could put in a CD or a DVD or a thumb drive or a floppy disk. It was a physical machine, and it had a name, and it had a caretaker. We called them sysadmins, and that was their job. <clears throat> and some of these computers were the, the size of a football stadium or a soccer stadium. They're very large. And some of them were, you know, not as big. And then we start entering kind of the era of every enterprise, big companies, having their own data center. So computers get a little bit smaller. We apply Moore's law. Now servers are, you know, they can fit in a rack. Um, they still require a lot of energy, a lot of cooling. But big enterprises can afford to build their own data centers. So we start seeing the, uh, the wholesale colo and the, the re retail colo start come up with all of these individual data centers. And then very quickly, these organizations realized that they weren't getting utilization out of those servers. You buy a server from you know, Sun or Dell, and it has, at the time, maybe four gigs of RAM, uh, but your applications only required like 55 kilobytes of RAM. So you had this massive over-provisioning of resources, and we didn't have a good way to run multiple applications on the same machine. So we needed an isolation layer. And this is where you start seeing like Zen and VMware come into the picture. <clears throat> so we start seeing hypervisors, where we can run multiple operating systems, multiple virtual machines on one physical machine. But this added some complexity. We now have overlay networks. We have the network within the virtualized appliance, but then we also have the physical network. And we start seeing machines are no longer connected via serial cables. We start seeing a lot of you know, layer 3, layer 5, layer 7 networking start to come into play. And then more recently, we've entered the era of the containerized workflow, where VMs gave us operating system and kernel level isolation. But we didn't need that much. We didn't need a whole new operating system. We just needed containerization. And you know, containers have been around for a long time. Like LXC is probably one of the oldest technologies out there. But you know, Docker created the proliferation of these containers. And we start seeing, you know, applications packaged, deploying containers, the schedulers, all of this stuff is, is really rapidly approaching. And then to add additional complexity to that, we don't manage all of our infrastructure anymore. So 20 years ago, your database, your caching server, your application code was all in-house. It was all in the one data center or multiple data centers. Now, we have all of these services. We have uh, DNS as a service. We have Postgres as a service. We have cloud databases as a service, CDNs as a service. So instead of all of those things being in-house, we've moved into specialized services that are external to our own data center. And then the rise of cloud technologies hasn't helped that at all. So some organizations have a physical data center and a cloud-based data center or multi-cloud-based data centers, and they're trying to peer traffic between them, and they're trying to route users to different data centers. And it turns out that if you look at pretty much any organization that's been around for longer than 10 years, they have something that looks like this. 
They have a mix of physical machines and a physical data center. Some of them are running VMs, and some of those VMs have containers on them. And they might be like kind of moving to cloud, or they might not be. And you know, they might be using Heroku for some stuff, and they might be using an RDS database for some other stuff. And really what it boils down to is that there's so much complexity here. No longer do we have one physical machine with a serial port that we can physically walk up to and touch. Instead, we have compute, and we have storage, and we have abstractions of these components that we used to be able to reason about. And we have a mixture of all the asses, your IaaS, your PS, your CS, your software infrastructure and platform as a service. So these are things not only just like the cloud providers, but also very specialized services, things that just provide DNS or just provide application runtimes. So with all this added complexity, we had to find a way to tame this. Previously, <clears throat> before the modern cloud era, we have this thing called the APID cycle. Um, so acquire, provision, update, and delete a server. And if you think about maybe 20 years ago, for those of you that have been in industry for a while, this process was very time consuming. To acquire a new physical server, someone had to get on the phone uh, or send a fax, those are still things, faxes, and acquire a server. You had to talk to a procurement department, you had to allocate funds, and you had to send a purchase order to one of the vendors, like Dell or IBM or, or Sun, to get physical machines. And that process took a really long time. And then after you got that machine, once it shipped to you in like six to eight weeks via you know, FedEx or UPS, someone would have to unbox it, take the cellophane off, put it in a rack, plug it in, connect it to the network, provision the initial set of software and users. And then from there, there's kind of this infinite life cycle of updating that server, making sure that the security patches are up to date, making sure that the users are there, making sure that applications have the correct packages for their dependencies and runtime. And then at some point, that server needs to be decommissioned or destroyed. Maybe it's getting repurposed, moved to another data center, you know, installing a newer operating system, or maybe it's just time to trash it, claim the loss on the taxes, and you know, newer technology, newer server comes in the rack. And that process took a really long time. Um, there was a study by the NRDC that said the average acquisition from time that you realized you needed a new server until you could run an application on it was somewhere between three and four months back in, I think, 1985. So you're talking weeks to acquire, days to provision, you know, an infinite amount of time to update, and then days to decommission the server. But presently, we have this era of elastic compute and all of the services. So things like cloud technologies and elastic compute took the acquisition and delete cycle from weeks and days down to really minutes and seconds. So what previously took six weeks to acquire a server can now be done in one API call to Google or Amazon. And even if you're spinning up one of their largest instances, it can be done in you know, five or 10 minutes. Similarly, it's one API call to destroy an instance. You're no longer using that compute power, great. But because of that, we don't, have to, we don't think about things in terms of physical machines anymore. Instead, we think about things in terms of RAM, or disk I.O., or CPU cycles, or GPU cycles. And this move has shifted our thinking and companies' thinkings from capital expenses to operational expenses. And this is where sometimes you'll hear organizations say, oh, the cloud is too expensive. And that's because Prior to the cloud, you would acquire a server, and your organization could write off the cost of that server over time. You could depreciate that physical virtual or physical appliance as a write-off on your taxes. You could depreciate it over time. By switching to cloud technologies, you now have operational expenses. You have a monthly bill that might be less than the total cost of a server, but you can't write that off on your taxes. You're just paying for a service. And this was a big shift in the paradigm, and that's why we also started seeing even additional specialized services. Configuration management also saw a lot of increase in this area. We see tools like Puppet, Chef, Ansible, and Salt really leading the space here. But configuration management also includes things like Bash. Um, configuration management is still you know, yum install or app dash get install. It's the basics of config management. And that basic level of automation improved the um, provision and update cycle. So instead of someone copying and pasting commands from a wiki or manually typing commands into a machine to provision, we could codify that, capture it in code, 
using you know, a tool like Puppet or Chef or Ansible or Salt to just kick off a command, walk away, and come back and the server's provisioned. And you have guarantees that that server matches because of the, the guarantees the configuration management provides. So that took the provision and update cycle from you know, previously days down to minutes or seconds. You know, a quick CM update on an already provisioned system might take two or three seconds. Everything's up to date? Great. And this led to the proliferation of what I call specialized.com. I don't think that's a real website. It might be. But it's the idea that individual companies are forming around very specific and very specialized tasks. And you can consume those tasks via APIs. But those APIs add complexity. So when we think about the traditional modern data center, or even think about your own applications and your own organizations, you probably have a mix of physical machines, virtual machines, containers, and you're also communicating with third-party APIs. It's very unlikely that anyone in this room manages their own DNS servers. You probably delegate that to something like DIN or DN Simple unless you're a DNS provider. It's very unlikely that any of you, unless you work for a major cloud provider, are your own CDN. You're probably offloading that to something like Akamai or Fastly, who specialize in those technologies. But when you think about all of these dependencies and you start adding data layers and applications and containers on top of them, it very quickly becomes difficult to reason about. And then when you think about larger enterprises that have multiple data centers that span multiple countries and continents, and they have to network between them and somehow sync data, it starts to feel like this. So it's important to take a step back and ask, like, why? Why did we make VMs? Why do we put applications in containers? Why is Amazon a cloud provider? Why is Google? Why is Azure? Why is DigitalOcean? Why? why? And to do that, I like to hypothesize that the goal from the institution of computers has been to effectively deliver and maintain applications. Whether your application is a punch card that you feed into a Fortran system to get a quick calculation, or Redis, or a Rails app, or a Go app, the goal has always been the same, to effectively deliver and maintain applications. To put it another way, we want to move very quickly and not break things. So as quick as possible, I want to get code from my local development laptop or machine in front of a customer or in front of a user with minimal risk, maximum testing, and little thought. So this is really the breakdown of the application lifecycle. You want to provision infrastructure resources, whether it's a cloud or a physical data center. You need to secure those infrastructure resources, whether it's using TLS on the network layer or uh, you know, encryption within the applications themselves. And then you need to run those applications, whether you're using a tool like uh, running it on bare metal, like Upstart or Systemd, or you're using you know, a tool like Kubernetes or Nomad or Mesos to run it in a scheduled environment. And then you also want parity with production. And once it's in production, if you have a microservices-oriented architecture, you need a way to network and discover all of these tools. And that's really the HashiCorp vision, is we make these open source tools to solve these very specific problems. And if you've ever read the Tao of HashiCorp, <coughs> excuse me, we make and believe in the Unix philosophy, which means we build a tool, and that tool does one thing, and it does it very well. You would never expect the ls command to create a file, and you would never expect um, you know, the cat command to restart your computer. And the same thing is true here. We build service discovery technologies that discover services. They don't provision infrastructure. And we build infrastructure provisioning tools that don't secure your infrastructure, because we have a security tool that is responsible for that. And all of these are completely free and open source. But today, I want to focus on three of them. And then tomorrow, I'm talking about Vault. First, I want to talk about Terraform. So why did we make Terraform? Well, Terraform's designed to answer the questions that I've been posing in front of you, which is, how do I provision these resources? Terraform answers the acquisition and delete cycle of the APID process. How do I provision things that's more than compute, though? I need storage. I need network. How do I get those things? How do I manage the life cycle of those resources over time? There are a lot of great tools out there that provision infrastructure, but then they're done. 
But we learned very quickly through our own uh, findings and our own infrastructure use cases that infrastructure is not a static thing. You don't click a button and walk away. Instead, you're constantly iterating, building new images, deleting images, upgrading, downsizing to meet the needs of your customer base. So we needed a tool that could support that workflow. Not just provision infrastructure, but manage the life cycle of those infrastructure resources over time. And then how do I balance the different service providers? The big buzzword right now is hybrid cloud and multi-cloud. Right? No one wants to go all Amazon because they might compete with Amazon someday, or Amazon could jack up their prices and then you're stuck. And you know, no one wants to go all Google or all Azure for the same reason. So a lot of big organizations are going hybrid cloud. And many of the cloud providers have their own tool for provisioning infrastructure. A popular one is like CloudFormation or Deployment Manager. But these tools don't support multi-cloud or hybrid cloud. They don't let you link up your EC2 instance to communicate with your Google storage backend. Terraform does. How do I enforce policy across all these resources? So how do I make sure that the permissions are correct? How can I test that? And then most importantly, how can I automate it? Because running commands in a CLI um, to make every single little change isn't sustainable. You can't automate it, you can't test it. So Terraform's goal is to provide a single workflow with a unified view that uses this concept of infrastructure as code that can not only provision infrastructure but manage that infrastructure over time that's capable of doing really simple stuff, like spinning up a blog, but is also capable of spinning up huge, multiple, end-tier, multi-cloud applications, all with a single command. So for those of you that have never seen Terraform configuration before, this is what it looks like. It's a very declarative syntax. And what we're doing here in this example is creating a DigitalOcean droplet, which is like an EC2 instance or a compute image on Google, and we're assigning it a DNS record. So you can imagine this is like spinning up my personal blog. I have a DigitalOcean droplet, and I point you know, sethvargo.com at that DigitalOcean droplet's IP address. Each stanza is highly declarative and self-contained. And Terraform under the hood actually uses a lot of academia. Its basis and its roots are in graph theory. And those of you that came to my training course yesterday know what I'm talking about. But there's a lot of academics under the hood. And Terraform builds a dependency graph, a directed acyclic graph under the hood for modeling all these dependencies and handling the order of operations. But as a user, you don't have to think about that because Terraform has this really great built-in syntax called the interpolation syntax, which uses this uh, dull or curly brace syntax here, which lets you reference values from other resources. And that simple process builds the graph. This example here tells Terraform to create the DigitalOcean droplet before it creates the DNS record. And if we think about that, that makes sense. I can't create a DNS record and assign it an IP address until after I have that IP address. And cloud providers don't assign me an IP address until after the resource has been created. As you can see, the configuration is designed to be human friendly, but it supports JSON as well. So if you want to write in JSON or if you don't like the uh, Terraform configuration format, you're free to do that. It is very VCS friendly. This was something that was thought about from the very beginning. When you're capturing something as code, you want to be able to review that code in a meaningful manner. But really what it does is it captures your entire infrastructure, all your dependencies from scratch in a single text file. So you can collaborate as a team. You can um, you know, ship these to different organizations. You can publish them publicly to spin up different environments. In the last talk in this room, uh, someone talked about how they were using Terraform to spin up Kubernetes clusters. That's just one example of one of the many things you can do with Terraform. Once you build it once, though, you can deliver that to customers over and over and over again without the need to change or iterate or update. The reason that we can support this broad range of technologies is that Terraform has these providers or plugins that support a single integration point and provide a resource. So Terraform is broken up into three main parts, core, plugins, and then the upstream APIs or the providers themselves. The providers implement a simple create, read, update, and delete API to communicate with these third-party services like Amazon or Google or Fastly. They're pluggable, but more recently, we've started to see that Terraform can manage anything with an API. So I recently wrote a blog post on how you can use Terraform to manage your GitHub teams and permissions and labels on repositories. That's not infrastructure, right? That's not compute, that's not storage, that's GitHub repos. But imagine being able to have a declarative text file 
that said, all of these people in my organization have access to this repo. And when someone joins your company as a new employee, a new engineer, they submit a pull request to that repository to add themselves to the necessary permissions and teams that they need. Their manager approves, clicks merge, and they inherit access the next time that Terraform runs. Completely automated. No clicking, no API calls from a human, all automated. All with a single command, Terraform apply. There are over 65 built-in providers for infrastructure and API providers and counting. And because the provider um, system is a plugin-based system, there are third-party providers which are not inside Terraform Core that you can install on your own. And I know a lot of people are thinking like, oh, well, I'm on like legacy infrastructure. I can't, uh, none of this will work for me. It's terrible. I'm going to start napping. Well, we just announced support for Oracle and Oracle Enterprise and Oracle Public Cloud. And Terraform supports VMware, vCenter, and vSphere. So it's not just cloud technologies. It's anything with an API. So if you're stuck on legacy infrastructure and you want the new hotness, Terraform might be able to do that for you. But the Terraform plan is where some of the other power comes from. This is a preprocessor which tells you what will happen before it does. And this is something that's really unique to Terraform, <clears throat> uh, especially at its inception. Other tools have followed suit, but Terraform provides a dry run. It tells you what it's going to do. Here we can see that it's going to create a DigitalOcean droplet. That's what the plus sign indicates. And it fills in any of the attributes it knows. So this is creating a CentOS 5 32-bit image. I don't know why anyone would use a 32-bit image anymore, but there it is. You also see a number of these what look like HTML computed tags. These are values that the cloud provider or the infrastructure provider gives back. We don't know them in advance. So some examples there are like the status. Uh, whether it has you know, an IPv4 or an IPv6 address. And then if we scroll down a little bit, we see the interpolation is right in the output as well. The Terraform plan shows us what will happen, and it also explains certain actions. What do I mean by that? Well, if any of you have worked with Amazon or Google before, you know that if you change the base image, like the AMI ID, you, you can't do that as an online upgrade. Imagine switching from Linux to Windows and trying to do that online on the same machine. It's not possible. The bits are simply different. And the same is true for the cloud providers. With Terraform, it'll actually identify those instances where it needs to delete and recreate an instance, and it'll tell you very clearly in the output. So you can minimize downtime by recognizing the operations that have to take place to successfully complete the run. Previously, operators had to divine this change. And if you know the history of Terraform at all, You'll know that one of the main reasons we build Terraform is that previously our SaaS product was running entirely on Amazon. We made a change to cloud formation. We couldn't see the rollout effect, and it caused over six hours of downtime because a change to a VPC resulted in all of our instances being destroyed and then recreated. And that was impossible to visualize at the time. So Terraform gives you a lot of visibility, a lot of control over your infrastructure, but there's still a decent amount of uncertainty. We've solved the acquisition and delete cycle, but there's still that configuration management component, provisioning servers at runtime, and we're subject to runtime-related failures. So what does tomorrow's infrastructure look like? Well, at HashiCorp, we preach immutable infrastructure. How many people here are using immutable infrastructure? Yeah, you're not. It's actually not possible. Um, true immutable infrastructure means that, that you sign and checksum every bit of memory that runs on your machine. So unless you work for like the government, it's highly unlikely that anyone in this room is actually deploying immutable infrastructure. However, you might be following immutable infrastructure paradigms or patterns, and that's really great. So what is immutable infrastructure? Well, mutable infrastructure or changeable infrastructure mutates over time. So we run something like Chef or Puppet or Ansible or Salt as a service on the running machines in the cluster. So the production servers are running, let's just use Chef as an example. They're running the Chef agent, the Chef client agent, and they run you know, every 30 minutes. Over time, as we push our cookbook changes, new recipes, et cetera, the divergence happens. Perhaps we have a slight network blip where one package doesn't get updated on one of our 100 machines. Or um, perhaps one user just failed to create random computer mistake. And we might be alerted to that, but over time, what happens in immutable infrastructure is 
the level of confidence that your machines are the same or have reached convergence decreases over time. Similarly, the consistency between machines decreases over time. In fact, a recent study showed that on an average infrastructure, over 30 days, 10% of machines will be divergent, meaning they won't be the same, even though they're using the same configuration management tooling. And over 90 days, almost 65% of those machines will be different, unless they're reprovisioned from scratch. So a mutable infrastructure looks like this. Everything the same 100% of the time. So how do we achieve that? We know that a mutable infrastructure is faster. You just launch a pre-built image. It has all your software, all your users, everything on it pre-configured. But how do we get it on there in the first place? We can put immutable infrastructure in things like auto-scaling technologies so that we can very quickly scale without human intervention. We don't have to wait 30 minutes for Puppet or Chef to finish their configuration management run. If all of a sudden your website is on the front page of Hacker News and you're trying to scale, you don't have 30 minutes to provision new servers. You have maybe 30 seconds before the evil people on Hacker News start telling you how terrible you are. Immutable infrastructure allows for greater parity. We can actually check some of those images, and we know the thing that we're launching. But the challenge is that immutable infrastructure requires automation. It needs automation. And that's why we built Packer. So Packer is another open source tool that builds automated machine images. And I know what many of you are thinking here. They're like, ugh, machine images. Those are gross. Nobody wants those. But why? Like, why, as an industry, have we traditionally been against machine images? And the answer is simple. They used to be the way. Golden images, as they were called, were these quarterly, unchanged, and blessed images that the sysadmin and ops team manages inside the data center. So why? why? Like, they used to be the way. Why did we move away from them? Well, the changes were very slow and frustrating. And there were some culture aspects here as well. We had lots of teams trying to deploy their applications on the same server. So they're fighting over package versions. We weren't using virtualized technology or containerized technology at the time. Um, and we didn't have advanced configuration management tooling. So a lot of this stuff was done manually. So the sysadmins would schedule some time, and they would reprovision the new servers. And if something broke, it would take weeks to fix. The tooling wasn't as mature as it is today. We didn't have Chef, Puppet, Ansible, and Salt. The best thing at the time was CF Engine, and most companies weren't using it. They were just using Bash or wikis with copy and paste. Modern configuration management changed all of that. Chef, Puppet, Ansible, Salt, write a thing once, deploy it a million times. But ops without machine images is like applications without binaries. What do I mean by that? And I'm not trying to say that config management is dead or it's terrible. I'm trying to say that config management belongs at a different layer of the stack. Let's look at a typical application lifecycle, like a Go binary, Rust binary, Java binary. You have some source code, and you compile that source code into a binary. And that binary might contain some dynamically linked libraries, lib a, lib b, lib c. If one of those binaries fails to link, updated to an aversion, changes an API, the binary fails to build. And that binary fails, maybe it's in Jenkins, or maybe it's on your local laptop, but it fails to build, and it never makes its way in front of a customer. It never makes its way to a user, because the build failed. Now let's compare that to the mutable server lifecycle. We have a base server, like a, a base Red Hat or Ubuntu server, and we're trying to get to a ready server or a ready state. Well, the need for packages and networking and configuration management hasn't gone away. That, that challenge still exists. Even if you're running in a scheduled architecture with something like Kubernetes or Nomad or Mesos, you still need basic users. You don't want to run everything as root. Um, you, know, you still need the basic configuration management, make sure your packages are up to date, et cetera. In the mutable lifecycle, we have something like you know, Puppet or Chef running as an agent every 30 minutes. And if something breaks, a package is unavailable, the apt cache was unreachable, or you know, something happens at the network layer where all of a sudden you know, we can't access something. We have a, a temporary network outage or really bad latency where our packages can't update or we can't talk to a third party service. Or we have a bug in our CM. It made it through test, but we forgot to test this one pathway and our configuration management crashes. All of these result in an unhealthy ready server, 
So it's red up there at the top. This is an unhealthy ready server. It's not ready, but it's in the path of downtime. This is in front of customers. It might be receiving traffic. It might not, but it's in the path of downtime. Let's compare that to the machine image or the uh, immutable server lifecycle. We have a base server and a ready server, and it just works. Because that base server has all of our packages, all of our users, all of our configuration management baked into it. So how did we get there? Well, that's what Packer does. Packer embraces configuration management. It uses the same chef recipes, the same puppet modules, the same, um, I forget what Ansible calls them, Ansible playbooks? It uses the same Ansible playbooks that you're already using, but moves failure from runtime in front of customers in production to build time. So you run Packer in a tool like Jenkins or your CI server to output artifacts. And those artifacts can be Amazon AMIs or Google Compute Images, DigitalOcean droplets, or even things like Docker containers or Vagrant boxes. You can enforce parity with your different environments. You build an AMI once, and then you can launch it in multiple different environments, production, staging, et cetera. And you can even create parity with development. So your local developers might be using something like Vagrant or Docker for local development. Part of your build process can be to output one of those images that they consume and run locally. They use their same editor, their same everything, but they're running in the same or as close to the same production infrastructure as possible to reduce those bugs and reduce the, um, the number of integrations there. But this introduced some new challenges. So one of the biggest challenges and one of the common questions I get here is like, oh, but I rely on you know, the chef server or um, the puppet server to do things like service discovery. How do I tell my database uh, where my app is and how do I tell my app where my database is? I use chef search for that. Um, and my answer to that is that it, it didn't belong there in the first place. Um, and I think that configuration management trying to do service discovery is the same as LS trying to create a file. The architecture was not designed for that. We don't have edge triggering or push notifications in configuration management because it's a poll-based agent. You're restricted to a convergence interval, and change sets are really difficult to visualize. You can't think about the rollout impact. There's no tool to show you what the rollout impact's going to be. And this isn't you know, a bad mark against CM tools. I think that's just not what they were designed to do. They're architecturally the wrong choice. And that's why we built console. So console, again, fully open source tool, has four major components. Service discovery, health checking, key value, and uh, this ability to be multi-data center. And I want to break that down piece by piece. So what is service discovery? Well, simply put, service discovery is this idea that in a microservice-oriented architecture, you have services. In a traditional monolith, everything was local your order processing service and your data processing service and your credit card processing service were all in the same app. It was all of the same process. But when you move to microservices or you want to scale those components individually, now you have multiple instances of order processing, multiple instances of credit card processing, or perhaps you're offloading your data processing uh, to a third-party service like a cloud technology. But you need to be able to address those services. They need an IP address or a DNS address. Service discovery provides that. Uh, it's the basis for how you address services. In console, we have two primary service discovery interfaces that operate off of the same catalog. The first is the DNS interface. The DNS interface is zero touch and requires no application changes. So if you have a legacy application like a Haskell or Java or you know, something COBOL that was written a long time ago that nobody's really maintaining, it just kind of works, don't touch it, you can still use COBOL because you can rely on the kernel level resolution of DNS entries to do service discovery. Your application has no idea that it's actually talking to microservices, it's just hitting a DNS address. For more modern applications, you can get finer grained control and rich metadata by querying console's HTTP API. <clears throat> console allows for discovery of both internal and external services. Well, what do I mean by that? Well, an internal service is very simple. It's things within your VPC or within your data center. But what about external services? Like, what if you're using a hosted database service? It would still be great if you could talk to that as if it were a local service, identify it as a local service, without hard coding a really long RDS URL everywhere in your configs. 
And more so, when that changes, you want to be able to update it instantaneously. Console supports that with the internal and external service catalogs. So what does the DNS interface look like? Well, it's very simple. <coughs> the dot .console suffix is the TLD. And anything you query on the dot .console suffix, just like .com or .org or .edu, gets delegated to console, which is running in a client-server relationship. Here, I'm querying for services because I'm using the dot .service dot .console TLD. And I'm querying for all services named web. So services have a name. We call this a logical service name. So I might have a service named order processing. And there might be 15 or 20 instances of those. What the console DNS service is going to do is it's going to randomize round robin me three IP addresses at a time for all of the healthy services. So we'll talk about that in a second. But the health checking is deeply integrated with the service discovery. So you never route traffic to an unhealthy host. Here's an example of using the HTTP API. You'll get back a big JSON blob that includes a ton of metadata, most of which isn't actually relevant to your application unless you're using some of console's internals. But you'll be able to build rich metadata, rich load balancing, or do things like prepared queries. Perhaps you want to build a query that says, use the data center that is closest to me, has the lowest latency to me, but fail over to the next closest one if that one's not available. The next punk component of console is health checking. As I said before, unhealthy services are removed from the discovery layer. And this is something that's really unique to console, is that we tightly couple health checking and service discovery. You might have a, a, a health checking solution now, like you know, Nagios or Sensu, that is uh, occasionally checking into your nodes and making sure they're healthy and using heartbeats, et cetera. But at the end of the day, if a node is unhealthy, someone has to remove it from the load balancer. Someone has to go repair it manually. With console health checking, it's integrated with the service discovery layer, and the DNS just simply doesn't return results that are unhealthy. So what that means is if you tell your application, talk to database.service.console, and for some reason, one of the, the database uh, followers is down, its health check is failing, console just won't route traffic to it. Your application just won't route traffic to it because it won't be returned as one of those DNS results. So your application doesn't know how to check if the database is healthy. Console does. But by using the DNS interface, it just doesn't route traffic there automatically. For applications that are using the API endpoints, the API very clearly identifies if a node or a service is healthy or unhealthy. So you can use really complex, um, build complex tooling around that to determine whether you want to route or not. Console also supports a trinary state. So try as in three. Most uh, monitoring solutions have two states, passing and failing. Console has a third, which is warning. And this is really useful, because things that are warning do not trigger alerts, but get removed from service discovery. So why might that be useful? Well, let's say you have an order processing application that's very memory intensive. It uses a lot of memory to do its order processing. You can create a health check in console that says, OK, when memory is at 85% usage, warn. And when it's at 95% you know, usage, alert or fail. When memory reaches 85%, console will remove that from the discovery layer, meaning it won't receive new jobs. So it has an opportunity to clear its queues. Because hopefully, if your service is well behaved, the memory usage will go down as it clears out its queues. Then, once that application is healthy again, which is entirely automated, console is going to continue checking it. It'll just get re-added to the load balancer. So in this way, you get self-healing self-describing infrastructure. No one has to be woken up in the middle of the night just because one application server got a little bit too much memory. It'll self-heal. Somewhat out of left field is this integration with a key value store. Every time I talk about console, people are like, oh, you violated the Unix philosophy because a key value store is not at all related to service discovery. But it actually is. The key value store is a highly available storage mechanism for configuration and feature flags. When you're using configuration management, you might rely on something like Chef Puppet, Ansible, or Salt to be writing out your application configs, your database configs, whatever it might be. And at a 30-minute poll interval, that's not enough time to propagate a change throughout the system. Instead, you want something that's highly available and edge-triggered, like console's key value store, that the moment a change happens in configuration, it immediately propagates to all servers in the system who are watching that key. So this allows you to have a feature flag that instantaneously triggers across your entire fleet without waiting for a big CM process to come through. 
it supports this using what's called blocking queries that allow us to push out changes instantaneously to applications or services that are watching for those changes. And then it integrates with optional ACLs. So if you have particular data that is sensitive, you can prevent people using ACLs and tokens to retrieve that information at that path. But more importantly, the key value store is the primitive basis for automation and orchestration, which we'll talk about in a second. So what does the KV store look like? Well, you can write or use the API to integrate with the KV store. So here's an example of putting some data into the KV store. Here I'm putting the value bar at the key foo. And here I'm getting that data back out. So console KV get foo. So very simple, very straightforward, uh, easy to use. There's also, again, the API if you're uh, not using the console CLI directly. <clears throat> console also supports multiple data centers. So at HashiCorp, we define a data center as a high, a high bandwidth, low latency collection of machines. So like a VPC is our definition of a data center. Console usually queries the, the local data center, but if for some reason you need to query another data center, you can do that. And we have an open source UI that lets you see the health of all your data centers in one view. So for some reason, let's say hypothetically, um, my local data center is down, I could delegate a query to my Singapore data center or to my Germany data center, for example, because that's geographically closest. And we can do this again via the DNS or HTTP APIs. But what's really great about console are the things that are built on top of it. So in addition to your own integrations, console has a number of first class citizens for events, execs, and watches. The KV store, by being highly available and supporting the CAP theorem, allows us to build really powerful orchestration tools. We can do things like implement client-side leader election without the need to understand how leader election works and all the different consensus algorithms out there. We can build a distributed locking and event system and all of these approaches are proven to scale to thousands and even hundreds of thousands of agents. Some of the largest console clusters out there are 150,000, 200,000 nodes, and they're running at really high capacity consistently without failure. It's a very battle-tested technology that is production ready. So here's some examples of the orchestration layer. Once you move into a microservice-oriented architecture, you might need to do something like tail the logs across all of your services because you haven't implemented distributed logging yet. Or you might need to reboot all your particular application servers to do a kernel upgrade. And you need to do that level of orchestration. So instead of SSHing in every machine and manually running commands, you can use consoles, execs, and watchers, and built-in locking primitives to orchestrate this by running one command and walking away. So here's an example of an event execution that allows me to do application deployments. So I might have an event called deploy that pulls down a particular SHA from Git or GitHub and then executes the deploy script. On my servers, I can create a watch for that deploy, and that deploy is, uh, receives the payload in that script. Or I could manually execute my own deploy using the console exec command. All three of these are um, basically the same thing. So what about security? Well, console uses a gossip protocol that's primarily over UDP. And if you know anything about UDP, that's not really secure, especially if you're in a shared environment. Uh, UDP, like multicast or um, MCAST, is anyone on the network can listen. So console has the ability to encrypt that traffic using a uh, symmetric key. So all of the agents share a key. They encrypt the traffic. So anyone who's on the network who doesn't have that key would be unable to see that traffic. So we have encryption at the gossip layer. But we also have encryption at the HTTP layer. So you can put uh, you know, a TLS uh, requirement in front of console. In addition to being able to just use TLS and make sure that the server is validated, you can also require client-side TLS certificates to verify that each agent can talk to the console server. So by using a, a common certificate authority, like an intermediate or a self-signed CA that's installed on all the hosts, uh, you can verify that anyone communicating with console is signed by that same central CA. And then as I mentioned before, we have a really advanced ACL and token-based authentication system that provides for really massive scale. Uh, and when I, when I say massive scale, I am talking about hundreds of thousands of nodes pushing you know, petabytes or terabytes of data through the system. So not just a couple hundred nodes. So to kind of summarize, we have three technologies we've talked about here today. 
We started with Terraform, which is a tool for managing the complexity of the modern data center. All of these APIs, all of these upstream tools. Then we talked about Packer, which is our tool for immutable infrastructure. Packer moves configuration management and failures from runtime to build time by using automation to output multiple machine images, like Amazon AMIs or Docker containers. But then once we move to this immutable infrastructure paradigm, we need a tool to be able to orchestrate across these machines. And that's what console does. It provides service discovery and orchestration at the data center layer. As I said before, all of these tools completely open source. How do we make money? Well, we sell. Turns out you can't build a business by giving everything away for free. So how do we make money? Well, we sell enterprise versions of these software that include additional functionality that we think only benefits enterprise users, so the, the Fortune 500 or Fortune 100 companies. We have lots of companies who are using the open source tools successfully, and we never intentionally hold something back from open source because we think it'll make money. Things that you're going to see in the enterprise tools are going to be things like Active Directory and LDAP integration. Things that, you know, at a medium-sized startup or even a, a large company, you're not going to start to see a lot. But when you reach an enterprise with hundreds of thousands of employees, that's where you start seeing the enterprise features, uh, which are paid. More importantly, everything we do is completely dog-fooded. Is that a thing? Do people know what that means here? Or is that an English thing? So dog-fooded is this idea that we use all of our tools internally. We have a SaaS product um, for Terraform. That product is deployed by Terraform, and it's deployed onto Nomad. Everything we do at HashiCorp runs on our tooling. Our developers use Vagrant locally. And sometimes we run our own pre-releases and our own beta versions internally before we ever publish it publicly. So that means when you're getting the software that you download, we've already tested it, and we're already running it in production. We've already found all of the bugs. <clears throat> and it's not just us. We have hundreds of customers who are using this in production every day. So with that, I'm done. Are there any questions? Other questions? Come on. I'll ask a question. Seth, <laughs> do you have stickers? I do have stickers. <laughs> that was a great question, by the it way. It was, yes. <laughs> Any questions around? Or anything else HashiCorp is doing? I think Seth is able to, to answer that question as well. Thank God. <laughs> Thanks for your talk. Um, how do you uh, run Terraform internally? Like, how do you trigger the Terraform runs? Uh, very carefully. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so we use our paid product, which is Terraform Enterprise. It's a uh, either a hosted or on-premise, but it's a, basically Terraform as a service. So instead of a developer running Terraform locally, which is totally valid, totally scalable, uh, Terraform Enterprise gives us collaboration. So we can say, like, oh, this change looks good, this change doesn't, and it gives us a full history of changes. It also lets us control the Terraform version. So we can opt into like pre-release versions on Terraform Enterprise, even if the binary isn't published yet. Uh, but it's it's a permission-based model as well. So we have you know only people on our ops team can actually make ops-based changes. But each you know um, we have a, a a team that works on Vagrant and they can control like a subset of the infrastructure. And that's what you get out of Terraform Enterprise that you don't get out of running Terraform locally. Okay, thanks. Thanks for the talk. Uh, will there be Terraform version 1.0? Um, so the question is, will it be, when will Terraform be 1.0? Um, this is a, a question we get asked a lot, um, especially in customer meetings. You know, people think that <clears throat> 1.0 is something special. Um, at HashiCorp, we don't really follow Semver for our products. We follow semantic versioning for our libraries, but not for our products. Um, it, and it's always interesting to hear people ask this question, because if you look at Microsoft Office, um, it started at 13.5. Like, to some organizations, version numbers mean a lot, and to others, they don't. And to us, a major version, a 1.0, is our guarantee that the API will not change. For us, 0 0.2 is API stability. So when you hit 0 0.2.0, that is whenever you can run this in production, it's ready to go. It's not going to crash, it's not going to panic. But you might not get the logging and the metrics and the analysis in the event of like something going on. When you hit 0.3.0, that's where we think like this thing is production ready, and you can use it at scale. 
everything beyond that is trying to identify the landscape of like what makes console or Terraform or, or Packer 1.0. And for Packer, we just hit 1.0. And that was when we, we identified what we think is the feature set, the complete feature set. And for Terraform, for us to reach 1.0, we need a really stable provider plugin API. And that's something we're working on now. We need a way for plugins, like providers and provisioners, to be able to iterate separately from Terraform's core. And that's something our team is actively focused on. It's a conversation I'm actually a part of to try to build that ecosystem out. And once we get to that, Terraform can very quickly go to 1.0. It then becomes a question of when does the AWS provider go to 1.0? When does the Terraform uh, Google provider go to 1.0? And those are different questions. Because a lot of those, particularly for you know, Google and Amazon, is they're still making products. And they're going to continue making products. So if we make a 1.0, how do we handle a situation where Amazon deprecates an API? Because that breaks our API promise. So to a certain extent, we're also waiting for stability upstream in Terraform. For console, we have a much clearer path to 1.0. So you, you'll probably see that um, this year or early next year. But my recommendation is don't, don't let 1.0 hold you back. It's not an indication of stability. Question over here. Hi. Uh, thank you for, my, for your talk. Um, I have a question. Um, if you have a typical infrastructure, let's say, that has a Terraform and then spins up, say, some VMs, which then inside of them run Puppet or something like that. Um, how would you build the scenario where something in those VMs uh, produces some data which you want to feed back into the definition of your Terraform infrastructure? For example, you know, some value that indicates uh, their load or some other thing that you want to then cause Terraform to have more of something or less of something or do something entirely, that feedback mechanism. So uh, the, the question is basically, how do I get information back into Terraform from the things I provision? Um, there's a few ways to do that. The most common one is using the console provider. So um, if you're running console on these machines, you can actually write to console's key value store from the machine. So you write to you know the key uh, Terraform slash instance one slash load with a value of 0.08 or something, right? Terraform has a, a resource, uh, it's, what, it's called a data source, which is a read-only resource for query and console. So it can then reach in to your data center via like a bastion host and read from that console data store to pull that data out and act on it. So when that data changes in the VM, it'll go into console and then console will cause Terraform apply to run right away? You can't trigger it that way because the, the data is kind of, it's like a one-way one way, um, you would have to be running Terraform on some type of interval. Um, so you run Terraform every 10 minutes to trigger that change. I see. OK, thank you. It sounds like what you're asking is, how do I build my own auto scaling um, based off of data? Um, and that's currently like an unsolved problem that a lot of people are trying to solve. Uh, thanks for your talk. A um, short question for the um, service discovery in console. Uh, you showed an example with .console as a TLD. Is this fixed? Um, so the question is, is .console fixed? Um, no, everything in console is configurable. So if you wanted to run it at .banana, you could run it at .banana. Uh, it also supports recursors. So you can query everything to console. It'll, you, can, you can set it as like your local DNS server. And anything it can't resolve, it can forward to like 8.8.8.8 or 8.8.4.4. OK, um, quick follow up. Uh, have you um, applied for the tld.console? Um, no. Because uh, we've made, uh, uh, we've had the experience with other, in <coughs> sorry, internal domains which got bought as a generic tld and broke many customer infrastructures. I think that's a good question or a good point, and it's something you know I'll raise with the team. Um, it's a pretty hefty investment. I think it's like two million dollars. But um, I, the way you generally architect console, that would probably never be an issue because the general installation paradigm is uh, you always run a local agent, so it's a client server, but the the agent, the client, always runs locally, and then you use a tool like DNS Mask to delegate all queries to localhost. So they would actually hit console before hitting like resolve conf or anything like that. So even if someone did purchase that TLD, it wouldn't resolve outside of that unless console didn't resolve, then it would hit that TLD. Uh, other questions? I 
was wo was wondering, you are highly uh, dependent somehow of the um, of the providers um, in Terraform. Uh, how do you ensure um, the compatibility, um, especially if something changes? And just regarding HashCorp, you have a lot of tools and a lot of dependencies in, inside your tools. Um, I'm just wondering how big uh, HashCorp actually is. Um, so we just crossed 100 employees um, like three days ago. Um, so that was cool, a cool milestone. For the providers in Terraform specifically, because the surface area is infinite, like the, it is actually infinite, um, we have a few different models. There are people internally at HashiCorp whose full-time job is to work on Terraform core. They work on the graph theory, the config parsing, everything that is not providers. We then have provider teams. So we have um, two and a half full-time engineers who work entirely on Amazon. We also have agreements with companies like Oracle and um, Google where they will provide us resources. So Google, for example, um, there's a person at Google, her name's Dana Willow. She works for Google, Google signs her paycheck, but she works full-time on Terraform. Um, and she is kind of the owner and the curator for all of the Google Cloud um, resources. And we have a really great symbiotic relationship with them because Google supports that project. It's something that they push forward in their customers, et cetera. So they want to give us resources. Other things are community maintained. Um, so for example, DN Simple, which is a DNS provider, that's entirely maintained by their company. Um, they do everything, they manage it. We just you know, merge their pull requests because we trust that they know their API better than we do. Um, so it really depends on what you're talking about. For the major cloud providers, um, Azure, we have a slightly different working relationship with. Um, with Azure, they give us code, but they don't maintain it over time. So we do like the day-to-day -day issue triage, uh, and then they'll occasionally come in and do like a mass update of you know new APIs that are available and like changes to their SDK. So it really depends, but we have like a pretty good sustainability model in place. So. Um how can I implement a, my own like provider for Terraform? Is it just is it like integrated to the source code of Terraform, or can I build some kind of library, uh, some kind of binary that then gets called by Terraform? So good question. The question is, how do I build my own? Uh, maybe I have my own cloud provider or my own technology, and I want to integrate with Terraform. First, your API has to support four operations: create, read, update, and delete. If it only supports read, you're creating what's called a data source, but that's an implementation detail. Uh, Terraform's plugin model is a gRPC server client model. So you build your plugin in any language you want, but it's easiest to write in Go, because that's the language that Terraform's written in, and there's lots of examples. You build the plugin using what's called helper schema. This is kind of a, a real low level thing, but you build a helper schema. You say, these are my inputs, these are my outputs, these are the API calls I want, and then you build it, just a standard Go binary with Go build. Then you put it in a a directory that's either adjacent to where you're running Terraform or in a local.terraform directory on your machine, and Terraform picks it up. So if you name your binary Terraform-provider banana, it'll pick up anything prefixed with banana uh, when you register that. Um, it's possible to write providers in other languages. It's just a little bit harder because you have to re-implement uh, some of the internals of Terraform in your plugin. Then from distribution, you just distribute that binary to your customers or to your users. Now, there are things on the roadmap for Terraform, like a Terraform plugin install command that would automate that process a little bit more. But it's very easy to write your own Terraform plugin. And there's actually a guide that yours truly just wrote the other day. Um, I will throw this up here. Um, not this one. This one. Um, this is a, a like a step-by-step -step guide of writing your own provider. Um, you know, it's a little bit long, but there's a lot of Terraform internals here. But it gives you some code samples of like, okay, here's how you serve the plugin. Um, here's the naming conventions that I just talked about, and then you know, here's a, a resource um, just defines like a create, read, update, and delete function. Yeah, over here. Okay. So the last question. So you say you, you do dog fooding, but uh, for example, why isn't the Nomad uh, plugin in Terraform uh, supported by HashCorp is in the community supported plugins? Why is the Nomad? The Nomad uh, plugin in the Nomad provider in Terraform is community supported. Um, it's not. We support it. It's probably just not documented correctly. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> uh, we, we maintain all of the HashCorp ones, so console, vault, and Nomad. Um, we also maintain the Kubernetes ones now. Um, it's possible that, that documentation is just out of date. 
Okay, thank you. It might have been originally community contributed, which is why it might have that at top, but we everything that has our name on it, we maintain. Okay. So, yeah, we're done. Time is over. Thank you very much again for a great talk. <laughs>